All right. So while you're turning to First Samuel chapter eight, um, unless you've been uh, uh, living on Mars, um, you probably know that um, uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, passed away on September uh, the eighth. Who was um, I was going to say our sovereign. But uh, it's not everybody's sovereign here, I guess. <laughs> um, um, and so that means that we have a new king, King Charles um, the Third. And so for pretty much everybody um, alive, pretty much everybody alive, not everyone, but pretty much, she was the only sovereign um, that uh, that we knew. So. Um, you know, she had a 70 year reign and um, her reign was only nine, nine years old when I was born. So I've known her as my sovereign for um, all of that, all of that time. And um, we, uh, you know, we, we basically had Sky News from England on pretty much 24 seven for about 12 days <laughs> on our TV, sort of watching things about it. And you know, you, you, you saw the funeral and things like that, and, and people were saying things about people's life. And uh, it was a pretty consistent sort of theme all the way through. And it, it talked about a life of service, a life of consistency, um, of wisdom, of experience, perhaps, um, of, of duty, all of which are good traits to have. I thought it was interesting that um, her first prime minister and her last prime minister were born 101 years apart. So Winston Churchill, who was her first prime minister, was born in 1874. And her last prime minister, which is Liz Truss, was born in 1975. So 101 years apart, um, these, these two people were, were born there. So I thought we would have a bit of a look at um, royalty, at, at, at kings things like that. So 1 Samuel chapter um, 8 and verse 1, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the first was Joel and the name of, of his second Abiah and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways but turned aside after Lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Excuse me. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel to Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons walk not in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel. And they said, Give us a king to judge us. And, uh, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have uh, done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods so do they also unto you now therefore hearken unto their voice how be it you protest how be it yet protest solemnly to them and show them what manner of king that shall uh, that shall reign over the, over them um, the corruption of man, the, the boys, I guess, in this case, um, sort of made the people um, blind to the position that they were in. And they didn't realise that they already had a king. They already had a king reigning over them that um, had a great history up to this point, of course, of, of looking after them and uh, providing for them and uh, doing all amazing, a lot of amazing things, um, you know, for the people. They even talked about, about their, about all the works that, that uh, have done since I brought them up out of Egypt. So he's sort of reminding them, I brought you up out of Egypt and yet look where you, look where you, look where you got to. Um, they already had a king that fought their battles. Um, who wanted to bless them. But as you sort of read on a bit, um, 
which we're not going to do. Um, in 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 verse nine, at the end of it, he says, "And show them the matter of the king that will reign over them." And Samuel goes on to tell the people, "Look, if you appoint this king, he's going to take your sons and your land and your money and all of these things. He's going to take them for him uh, himself, and he's going to have people working for him. Whereas now you've got a king who works for you, and yet this is what you this is what you you want." They say that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Maybe that's what they thought. Um, they soon discovered um, uh, otherwise. They wanted, they wanted to see this king with their own eyes. They wanted it to be some tangible thing, this tangible person. And yet they rejected God. And obviously God knew their heart. And he said, you know, that they haven't rejected you. Um, Samuel but they've rejected me and and we live in a world where the king's reign has been rejected I'm not talking about Charles the king's reign has been rejected by the world in general um, you know we read about Jesus even we will not have this man to reign over us and so um, they kind of wanted this king and that's what that's what they got now if you go to chapter 10 and um, um so Saul has been selected to be the king at this point but in verse 1 of chapter 10 Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said it is not because the Lord has uh, is it not because the Lord has anointed you to be captain of his inheritance. Um, when you are departed from me today, then you shall find two men by Rachel's sepulchre at the border of Benjamin at Zelzar, and they will say to you, the asses which you went to seek are found, and lo, thy father has left the care of the asses and sorrows for you, saying, what shall I do, um, my son? And so he sort of goes out, um, and he goes to these different places, uh, the plain of Tabor, and, and all of these um, all of these sort of things. Um, and if you go to verse um, five, it says, after that, you shall come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it will come to pass when you are come thither to the city, that you shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them. And they shall prophesy. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you shall prophesy with them and shall be turned uh, turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come to you that you do as occasion serves thee, for God is with thee. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you and offer uh, burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry till I come to you and show you what you shall do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart and those signs came to pass that day. And so the first king of Israel is anointed, um, anointed with oil, which is to set, uh, to set a pattern. Even the current uh, monarch, when his coronation is, which will probably be next year sometime, will be anointed with oil in this very same, very same way. Um, so this pattern is set, oil, of course, representing uh, the Holy Spirit in someone's, in someone's life. In order to be king, the spirit had to be present. In order to be royalty, the spirit um, had to be there. We have to be given another heart in order to be king, as it said in verse 9. God gave him another heart. And all those signs that God said would happen came to pass um, came to pass um, that day. Um, it seems that, um, you know, Saul sort of started off quite well at one point. Uh, um, he, he seems to be humble. Samuel reminded him of that when he sort of made the mistake with uh, Amalek and all those sort of things that, you know, you were, you were little in your own sight. He was a humble man in his own sight. Um, if we look at verse um, 
17 says, Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. And you have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, no, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And so Samuel sort of having one last little dig at them, I guess. You, you've rejected your, your true king. We will not have this king reign, um, reign over us. Um, let's see, let's skip a little bit. Um, in verse 24, it says, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king, which is um, something that is still being said to this very day. God save the king. Actually, maybe for the Australians more so, but doesn't it sound very strange to say God save the king? <laughs> having not said it for your whole life to now having to say God, God save the king. Well, here it is um, in the Bible. And so they started rejecting God and moving on with this with this person. Um, so a couple of little facts I thought I'd throw in. We, I'm sure you know that uh, Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning British monarch in history. She was on the throne for 70 years. Um, only uh, only um, three others actually were more than 50. Queen Victoria, 63 years. George III, 60 years. And Henry III, uh, 56 years. The first Queen Elizabeth, in the uh, you know 1500s there was um was 45 and so reigns don't typically tend to be very long and there have been lots of kings and queens over the century starting with this guy Saul we we think of uh, David and all the stories about David that are in the Bible Solomon his son Jehoshaphat um, that set himself and set Israel uh, against the armies coming before him and a, and a great victory was won. You think of um, uh, Josiah, uh, one of the kings of, of uh, Israel there. And into, well, I was going to say more modern times, but I'm talking 1066, like a thousand years ago. William the Conqueror, uh, the Battle of Hastings in 1066, very famous battle um, where that guy became uh, king. Um, you think of other famous kings, Henry VIII. For example, uh, very famous king. Um, if you were a wife of Henry VIII, that typically wasn't a good move. Um, a lot of them lost their head over the whole thing. Um, so anyway, Henry VIII. Um, William IV, uh, King William IV um, was king from 1830 to 1837. And he had a wife and her name was Adelaide. And the city of Adelaide is named after uh, Queen Adelaide, his wife. And then Victoria, of course, uh, reigned a long time. Uh, Edward VIII, um, he decided he wanted to marry uh, someone that he shouldn't marry instead of being king. So he abdicated in 1936. His brother became king, which was George VI, and his daughter became queen, which was Queen Elizabeth II. So you've got all these kings and queens. Some reigned very well, some reigned not so well, some reigned very badly, some reigned for a long time, and some reigned for a short time. But every single one of them have something in common, and that is their reign came to an end. Every single one of them had that um, had that thing happen to them. Even uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who I guess a lot of people thought, well, she'll just live forever kind of thing. She seemed to have already lived forever. Um, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't to be. 
And so they all had these things in common, whether they were good or bad or reigned a long time or a short time or, or gave up the throne or whatever happened to them. Their reign, uh, their reign came to an end. But we're going to look at somebody whose reign did not and will not come to an end. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith he shall be called the Lord, uh, the Lord our righteousness. And throughout the Old Testament, um, this is just one of many, where there's this reference to a king who is going to come and rule. If you um, you don't have to turn to it, I'll just quote it in Micah chapter 5 it says but thou Bethlehem Ephrata though thou be little among the thousands of Judah yet out of you shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting so the Lord is saying you know the ruler is going to come out of this place and I've been telling you about this for a long time, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This, this plan to have this, to have this king um, has been set forth right from the uh, beginning chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 is the first reference to it, you know. In Isaiah it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform, will perform this. And so this is just a couple of references there's lots and lots and lots of references about about these things in the in the old testament about a king is going to be crammed and a king is coming um i always like verses that end with the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this it's kind of like well you might think it's a good idea you might think it's not a good idea you might think oh, i should do it differently but guess what this is how it's going to be. This is what is going to happen. I'm I'm enthusiastic about this. The Lord is saying, "My I have a zeal about this, and uh, I'm going I'm going to perform it." And so we sort of move into uh, uh, New Testament times. If you go to the Book of Luke, chapter one. Verse 26. Uh, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, you can see there, of course, that uh, Joseph was a descendant of um, King David. Um, as it turns out, if you sort of read the genealogy, uh, Mary was as as well through a different brother sort of thing. So they were both um, they were both uh, of the house of Judah, uh, which David was, and of the house of the house of, uh, of David. And we know that this reign was to last uh, uh, forever. In Second Chronicles, it says, Then will I establish a throne of thy kingdom, according as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. Now, there's a whole talk in that sentence, uh, which we're not going to go through today uh, uh, at all. And yet, for all of the scriptures about, uh, about Jesus, pretty much 
everybody missed the occasion. And it seemed that the more learned that you were, the more you would think that that person would know the Old Testament forwards and backwards kind of thing and, and should have known better is that they, they missed it. They missed the coming of the king. How, how would they miss it when there's so much you think uh, in there that would point to this exact moment in time? And yet, and yet they did. And you look around us now and you think people, you know, are told about the Holy Spirit and uh, the blessing of God and the evidence and speaking in tongues and, and uh, baptism and, and walking with the Lord and the word of God and all of those things are sort of presented. And yet the vast majority of people just totally miss it, totally don't get it are either uninterested or they think um, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't concern me. I've had people say that to me. This doesn't concern me. You probably had the same thing said to you. Mm -hmm. One day it's going to concern you. <laughs> it's going to concern you one day, whether you think it now or not, it is going to it is going to concern you. And so and so this time comes where that same throne all the way down from David gets to this gets to this point um there shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in israel now if you go to chapter three uh in verse one says in the 15th year of the reign of tiberius caesar pontius pilate being governor of judea and herod being tetrarch or governor of um of galilee and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Echuria and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God did a complete bypass of all of these people and came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in, in the wilderness. These people were in charge. That's what they thought. They thought they were in charge. Um, Tiberius Caesar if you were Tiberius Caesar you had pretty much no doubt that you were in charge <laughs> you were you were the boss everything that you said was going to was going to happen um, and then even someone like Pontius Pilate who was out there in uh, uh, sort of in the eastern part of the empire you might say in Judea had a lot of authority to do pretty much anything um, that he wanted. And so they thought that these people, uh, they, these people thought they were in charge, but God said, no, no, no. The, my word's going to come to this guy, John, the son of Zechariah, uh, in the wilderness. And verse three, and he came unto all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked will be made straight, and the rough ways be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And, and, and they would have read this too, and yet totally missed it, totally ignored it, didn't understand it glossed over it. who knows what they did but 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 missed it you know um uh in verse seven then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him O generation of vipers there's a there's a good way to start a witness isn't it O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves we have far, we have abraham to our father for I say to you, God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast uh, and cast into, into the fire. They thought they would be uh, in charge, in control, that their will would be done. Perhaps the world 
Perhaps the world thinks it's in charge of us. Um, what we might think, what we might believe. Um, uh, there's a lot of trying to modify our thinking, our behaviour perhaps, all the time. Um, these people were replaced and superseded and and done away with. And, and the ways of the world will go the same way, replaced and superseded and 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 done away with in fact this is really what i guess frightened these people the most it's why they ended up doing what they did because they were worried about um what um what was going to happen to their position you know in fact um Kaifa said something like well it's better that one man die than the whole nation sort of, you know, be taken from us sort of thing. And so ended up offering up Jesus. I won't read this bit out, but if you want to read in John chapter 11, it sort of talks about some of those things for a bit of homework. Um, in chapter 4, in verse 1, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so he goes out into this wilderness and he's tempted for 40 days and and, and 40, 40 nights. And he's he uh, he's fasting. And it says that uh, after that, he, he was hungry, which is not surprising. And so the devil comes to him and, and tempts him to, to, to prove him. And uh, each time uh, Jesus answers, answered with the word of God, because he loved the word of God. He knew the word of God. He, he knew what it he knew what it meant he knew what power uh he knew what power that it had and the things that um the devil was uh, uh offering him or showing him um were i guess in the natural sense uh, great things all the kingdoms of the world will i give to you well that might sound that might sound pretty good all the kingdoms of the world are mine but jesus rejected all of those things because he understood his position he he knew what he'd come uh what he'd come to do there um and so like so many jesus ministry jesus reign begins with a proving a trial uh, a, a temptation but the most important words i guess in this little section here is in verse one full of the holy ghost it makes all the difference even in our own life, of course, that the full of the Holy Ghost is what changed us. It's what made us to be what, what we've become, that we're able to overcome things. Why? Because we're full of the Holy Ghost. Why can we rejoice in the Lord? Because we're full of the Holy Ghost. Why do we understand uh, the Bible when we read it? Because we're full of the Holy Ghost and the Lord reveals it unto us. And so it's such an important little thing that Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, then he returns to Jordan. Then he, then he goes through all of those, um, all of those things. Um, we know that there's one coming, Jesus, of course, who is the rightful sovereign, who is our King, our King of Kings, um, and even his reign began with this pouring of oil. Exactly the same, the Holy Ghost. Uh, descended on Jesus, as it were. Um, in um, in verse eighteen, so he goes up and he um, he goes to this synagogue and there's delivered to him the uh, the book Isaiah, and um, he opens this uh, this book up, and um, you know, like we've said many times, it's not like he sort of sort of thumbed through and thought gosh, I better find something. What, what can I find? And sort of, no, no, no. This was very deliberate where he turned to. Um, and he read this out. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them 
that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say to them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears what a day that would have been mm -hmm. to have been sitting there listening to that yeah. did they understand it yeah. probably not really um certainly not the fullness of it but we can look back on it and see the um that see the fullness of it and so he he starts here with this with this vow with this this is what this is what i'm going to do all of these uh, all of these things um on her 21st birthday uh the queen also made a vow which i guess many people have seen lots and lots of times um, um she was in south africa at the time and uh uh knew that her reign was coming at some point she didn't know when but knew that it was coming and um at the end of it she made this little statement she said i declare before you all that my whole life whether it be long or short shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong but i shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailing, unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless you all who are willing to share, uh, share in it. And Jesus starts his ministry by announcing his, min his vision, his ministry. Maybe you might say his vow, knowing that one day that he would be crowned not just king but king of kings and and and, and lord of lords um and you know we're given this holy spirit and uh we we, we don't become an island do we um join in with me she said as i now invite you to do god help me to make good my vow and uh the lord does help us even if even if we might be uh, uh, down about something or uncertain about something or whatever it might be, the Lord will be there to lift us up and to and, and to and to show us and to and to reinvigorate reinvigorate us perhaps that as she knew that one day she was going to be crowned, Jesus Christ of course knows that He's going to be crowned this King of Kings. If you go to uh, John 18, verse 33, so he's before Pilate now. John 18, verse 33, and then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this of thyself? Or did others tell it of thee? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And every one that is of, of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault uh, at all. But you have a custom that I should release, release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We will not have this man reign over us. Here is a king doing something that typically monarchs down through the ages have not done. Typically, it was all about what can the people do and give and how can they serve their king. Here was someone doing it exactly the opposite way around. What can I do for you? I'm doing this. I'm doing this for you. I'm not answering these questions kind of thing. And Pilate um, 
asks about asks about truth when the very embodiment of truth are you a king then the real answer is i will be i'm going to be king i'm going to be sovereign not just of judea not just of the roman empire but of the universe of everything Pilate, of course you, you sort of read this and he's got no idea what he's doing does he he's got no idea what he's what he's talking about or what he's or, or who he's talking uh to he's thinking a king in this world you know are you a king where's your kingdom all this kind of stuff jesus is talking about something completely uh completely different altogether another realm a realm where the king serves the people which is so different to what uh to what to what we have um let's see we might need to sort of um skip a little bit um let's go to revelation chapter five so Julie, just going to move down a bit revelation chapter five in Acts chapter one though um um jesus is about to be taken up into heaven and you know they still thought that he was a political figure maybe a natural king um you know wilt thou this wilt thou this time restore the uh restore israel sort of thing and um he sort of had to tell them what was what was coming and um in acts chapter two the holy ghost is 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 poured out the anointing oil is poured out this time not just upon one person like it was for Saul and for all the kings this time it's for um everybody we read that he's made us kings and priests unto God um you you read in the book of Acts of people continuing that ministry that Jesus um came to set up he said greater works shall you do greater works shall you do amazing thing isn't it um and so as you sort of read through that book of acts um healing acts chapter three the man at the uh beautiful gate there gate beautiful healing provision and blessings and uh um all of those great all of those great things protection all of those things and from that point they just grow exponentially sort of throughout the region and uh starts off obviously in jerusalem but then spreads like wildfire through asia minor and um and uh, and, and italy and 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 greece and you, know, you get corinth and Tur what is modern day turkey ephesus and all of those all of those places and now of course it's come to the uttermost part of the earth um it's 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 spread like it's spread like that why why did that happen because of the sacrifice of the king exactly the opposite to what you would normally expect the sacrifice of the king is what made all of that uh possible now in extra uh, sorry revelation chapter five um in verse one it says and i saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written uh within and on the backside sealed with seven seals and i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof and no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereupon and i wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book neither to look thereon and one of the elders said to me weep not behold the lion of the tribe of judah the root of david has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof and i beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent forth um in all the in all the earth and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne and when he had taken the book the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb um, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of saints and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for you were slain and has redeemed us to god by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us uh, unto our god kings and priests 
that we should reign in the earth. And uh, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts of the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I think that's saying a lot. <laughs> saying with a loud voice, worthy is the land that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory uh, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea and all that in them heard I saying blessing and honour and glory and power be to him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lived forever and ever. What an amazing picture we get of grandeur, of majesty, of authority, of, of, of worship. Um, and because of all this, we're found worthy. It said there in the middle of all that to be called kings and priests to, to, to reign forever. Um, kings and queens, they, they, they come and go. Um, they succumb to the world just as perhaps we did. And eventually they succumb to the grave as we, as we um, will. But we're reading about someone here who's not subject to any of those things. Last time, yes, as a sacrifice. But next time, all this is, all this is before him. King of kings and Lord of lords. If we just finish in 19. Chapter 19, I mean. Sorry. And I think verse 11. And I saw, this is Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he, uh, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the great, uh, unto the great supper, um, uh, unto the supper of the great of the great God. And so we have this this picture again of of a ruler, an absolute ruler. He's he's got it written there, this King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords, and um, He's, he's been able to open that book and, uh, and the seals and all of those things. And this is our portion. This is what we're all about. This is what we're, this is what we're here for, for these, for these things. Whenever this will happen, we don't know. Um, whether it's in 100 years' time or a million years' time, it's irrelevant to us because we just want to be, we want to be um, part of this. Every time... The Queen visited Australia, everybody would line the streets, 20 deep. Um, I think uh, in, uh, in 1964, when she came to Adelaide, they said that 80% of the city lined the streets at the same time um, to see her. Why? Because she was our sovereign ruler and we wanted to see her. In... Um, I've told some people this story. In 1976, the then Prince Charles came to my school. Uh, I was in year uh, 10. Prince Charles came to our school. We had a very large oval, number of ovals, very large oval on our school. And a number of schools came to our school to sort of be there when he was there. And, um, you know, he came and he, he planted a tree and he got up and he spoke about you know, you are the people of the future kind of thing because we were only kids, um, all that sort of thing. And we were we were extremely excited, I can remember, that the future king 
would take time out just to come and see little old us, like on the other side of the world. We were very excited about it. Um, I've also mentioned that our school had those uh, uh, speed humps down the driveway, asphalt speed humps, and um, it was thought unfitting for the future King of England to drive over speed humps. So the school removed those speed humps, repaved the thing so that it was dead smooth. He drove in. He didn't know any of this. He drove in. He did his thing. I think he was there for a couple of hours. He drove out. And then the next day, they put the speed hunts back again because he had gone. And so that was kind of the deference, I suppose, that we had. Well, the real future king, Jesus Christ, took the time to visit us. He didn't plant a tree. He planted a word. He planted the Holy Ghost that dwells inside of you and me. How was this possible? By his sacrifice. Was there any alternative? No. Could anything else have worked? No, nothing else would have worked. The king had to sacrifice himself. One day he's going to return, of course, not as a baby in a manger, not as someone to be slaughtered, but as we read there, king of kings and lord of lords. We read that every knee shall bow, every uh, eye shall see him, every tongue will, will confess. We're going to be speechless, I'm sure, at the power that is going to be displayed when the true king returns for his throne. I don't know how true this is. I can't, I can't back it up with fact. It's only hearsay. But in all the things that I was watching on the television in the last couple of weeks, uh, it is rumoured that the queen said, I would like to be... I would like to be alive when Jesus Christ comes back so I can hand him his crown from her to him. So um, whether that's true or not, I can't say, but that's what I heard on the on the, uh, on the the telly there. So it's got to be true, doesn't it? It's on the telly, it's got to be true. The great news is, is that we and anyone who wants to be can be a part of these things that we're reading. Do we understand every little aspect of what they're talking about in, in Revelation here? Uh, I'm, I'm sure we don't. What's heaven going to be like? Not a clue. It is going to be very good. We know that. We know some aspects about it. What will it be exactly like? Well, we don't know. But we know we want to be part of it. You know, people worship a sovereign. Um, well, we've got to worship our real sovereign. That's Jesus Christ, our real king, because one day we're going to rule and reign with him. As it said in the book of Samuel there, and we're now saying, God save the king. But for us, as so many things are, it's the opposite. It's not God save the king. We're saved by the king. We're the ones who get saved by the king. They say when uh, when the queen uh, died, um, that the people in the room there would have said, the queen is dead, long live the king. Because it's meant to convey a continuous, unbroken monarchy. He's not made, Charles isn't made king by some ascension, although they do have that. He's not made king by the coronation, although they will have that. As she takes her last breath, he is king as he takes his next breath. It's that, it's instantaneous. It's an unbroken thing. And that's what we've got through Jesus Christ. It's an unbroken thing. It's going to be continuous. How long are we going to rule and reign for, Lord? Eternity? How long is that going to be? Long time. You know, you're going to, you're going to want to be involved in this. Our great king is coming back. And uh, we want to be found so doing. When the great king says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Boy, is that going to be a good day? All the people said. Amen. All right.